Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us today. My name is Francesca Preti Sanchez. I joined the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology as a PhD student in the Predators and Toxic Prey Research Group this year. And today I'm going to talk to you about poison frogs and how they avoid predation. So chemical defenses are widespread in nature. There are examples from bacteria, plants, and animals. And in animals, they exhibit a broad range of chemical structures, biological activities, as well as origins. Um, and these origins could be either come through biosynthesis. This means that the animals could synthesize these compounds themselves, or they could come from environmental sources, what is known as sequestration. So among tetrapods, only a few have the capacity of sequester uh, compounds from the environment. And I will tell you who are the animals who do this. So um, there are the birds from the genus Pitui and Ifrita. They are from New Guinea, and they sequester batracotoxin from uh, an assumed to be a beetle source, and they keep this patracotoxin in their feathers and their skin. There's also the Tamnophis snakes. They feed on newts from the genus Tarica, which have tetratodoxin. Then the Rhabdophis tigrinus snakes, they feed on uh, toads, Bufu japonicus, and from them they sequester bufadienolids and they storage them in these nuchal glands. And there is the group of poison frogs. This group comprises five families. One family is the Eleutherodactylidae with two species in Cuba. The family Buffoniae with the genus Melanophriniscus in Brazil. The family Mantellidae in Madagascar. The family Myobatrachiae with the genus Pseudophrine in Australia. And there is the group of the family Dendrobatidae uh, which is a neotropical family. This comprises more than 300 species. They are diurnal and they are frequently found associated to streams and in the leaf litter of the rainforest where they live. Um, so these, uh, these chemical compounds are alkaloids, as I mentioned before, and it comes from a dietary source, which could be ants, mites, and millipedes, but also from some beetles. So even though, even though most of the alkaloids known today come from these sources, there are still a lot of uh, alkaloids that we don't know where they come from. So this is a, a very active field of research. In the, this is a very nice summary figure of the chemical ecology of these frogs. So here in the left side of the slide, um, where we see these stars, we can see that the capacity of sequester alkaloids has evolved at least four times in this family. We can also see the proportion of ant and mites, and mites in their diet. Here in the upper part, we see some alkaloids and the color of the circles means whether they are toxic if they are in red or if they are just noxious in, in yellow. So for example, pumulotoxins, this one's here. Well, pum pumulotoxins are very toxic as well as batracotoxins. And um, actually these alkaloids are considered chemical defenses because they act on the ionic channels of cells. These alkaloids are stored in granular skin glands in the frogs. So this is a picture taken with a microscope. And you can see here like in this kind of bags, and this is where the alkaloids are stored. Um, another very interesting thing about poison frogs is that they exhibit parental care. And parental care could be either by the female, by the male, or by both. 
And in these pictures, you can see some examples of frogs taking care of their eggs or carrying tadpoles in their back. A really mm, special example is that of Ophaga pomilio. These frogs, uh, the females will lay their eggs in small pools in the leaf litter. Then males will fertilize them and males will also keep them, hydrate them. Then once um, the eggs are developed into tadpoles, females will carry them in their bags and transport them to individual axes of bromeliad leaves. And there they feed the tadpoles with unfer unfertilized eggs. And actually these eggs contain alkaloids that act as a chemical defense, at least for spiders and ants. These tadpoles also display a uh, begging behavior. As you can see in this video, it's uh, tadpoles will vibrate until the mother feeds them with the unfertilized eggs. So here you can see the tadpole vibrating and the mother laying some eggs. Um, also, um, in this figure, you can see the different genus of Dendroatriae. And as you can see, there is a wide diversity in coloration patterns. Most of them are very conspicuous, but there are uh, three genus which are kind of cryptic, meaning that they resemble more like the leaf litter, so they have brownish coloration. And, and it's still, when there, when there is this huge variation in coloration in, in this family, there's also a lot of variation in coloration within species. So this is an example with Ophaga pomilio. Uh, in the Bocas del Toro archipelago in Panama, where each island has a different color morph of these same species. And it's thought that this is due to different uh, predation pressures and also uh, because of assortative mating. Um, so one way how poison frogs could avoid predation is through aposematism. Aposematism is a defensive strategy where organisms that have a secondary defense, such as toxicity or unpleasant taste, will advertise it through, to predators through a warning signal, which is something conspicuous. So it could be either like a conspicuous coloration, a conspicuous smell, or a behavior. And together, these traits work because predators learn to associate them and then avoid this prey in the future. So as I mentioned before, uh, dendroatid poison frogs, they have alkaloids that are thought that work as chemical defenses, and also some species are conspicuous. So from the 300 or more than 300 species in the dendroatid family, one third of them are considered to be aposematic. So aposematism is widespread in nature. There are examples in invertebrates and also in vertebrates, as you can see from these uh, pictures of aposematic animals. And um, poison frogs of the Androatia family have been a model group for the study of aposematism because of this wide variation in both their chemical composition and their coloration. But what do we know about the predators of poison frogs? Uh, we actually know really little. These pictures you see here are the only uh, known predators of, of dendroatid frogs so far. So there have been events recorded by snakes, spiders, crabs, and birds. And um, this might suggest that actually their chemical defenses are effective at deterring predators. However, we, it's very important for the study of aposematism to know which are the predators selecting over their conspicuous coloration. 
So, as I mentioned before, it's very difficult or almost unlikely to spot a predation event in the wild. So there is an indirect way to assess whether predators are actually avoiding these frogs. And it's with the use of clay models. So in this kind of experiments, researchers will do clay models with different coloration patterns resembling poison frogs and will let, leave them in the field. Then they will pick them up and according to the marks left on the models, they could categoria, categorize potential predators. So for example, here you can see marks left by a bird and here the very distinguishable marks left by lizards. And these are examples with uh, poison frogs with Ophaga pumilio, Dendroatus cintorius, and Ophaga granulifera. In most of these studies, birds have been the main predator. So this supports the hypothesis that birds are the main agent selecting over conspicuous coloration in these groups, in this group of frogs. Um, so today I would like to talk to you a little bit about my master's research at the University of Costa Rica. There I worked with uh, Philoatus vitatus, which is a dendroatid poison frog that um, is suggested to be aposematic. So I tested this hypothesis. Philoatus vitatus is a species which is endemic from the South Pacific of Costa Rica. This means that in the whole world, in the whole world, you can only find it in this region, in the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica. So I sampled in three localities from the South Pacific of Costa Rica. Um, I assess conspicuousness for potential predators by taking reflectance spectra or coloration measurements of the frogs and conducting visual modeling. I also assess whether predators avoid their coloration. So with the help from a lot of people, I made a lot of clay models with different coloration and placed them in the field. I found predation by crabs, lizards, birds, insects, mammals, and some marks which I couldn't identify a potential predator. So I found that most of the predation was by crabs and lizards, and actually very little predation was by birds. So these results give us a hint towards trying to look for the role that other predators, uh, other than birds, could be uh, imposing selective pressures over their conspicuous coloration. Uh, but today I would like to talk to you a little bit more in detail of the chemical defenses of Philoates vitatus. So the genus Philoates comprises five species, Philoates vitatus in the South Pacific from Costa Rica, Philoates luguris in Costa Rica and Panama in the Caribbean side, and then Philoates aurotenia, Philoates bicolor, and Philoates terribilis in the Pacific side of Colombia. The main characteristic of this group is that uh, they are the only genus uh, which is able to sequester batracotoxin. And batracotoxin is a highly toxic alkaloid that acts on the sodium channels of cells. So it keeps them open and it causes an irreversible depolarization of cells. So at the end, it causes uh, arrhythmia and failure and cardiac failure. So you might have heard the popular term of poison dart frogs, and this comes from this practice from the indigenous peoples of Colombia. They use the skin of Philoates terribilis to poison the arrows that they use to hunt. Um, and just to give you a little bit of perspective of how toxic this frog is, one adult individual has enough, could have enough batracotoxin to kill up to 20,000 lab mice. So now Philoatus is a diurnal territorial species. They are the males usually fall from perch 
places or locks or exposed uh, positions in order to advertise to females and to defend their territory. They are found near streams. They feed on small arthropods such as um, ants, mites, flies, and millipedes. And as I mentioned before, it's endemic to Costa Rica. So Philoates vitatus belongs to a toxic genus, as I mentioned before. It's an understudied species within the Dendroapia family. Their amounts of patrocotoxin range from indetectable to very low. And um, there was a study where the authors didn't find batracotoxin in their skin, so they suggested that this species might not be toxic, but rather take advantage of living in the same uh, habitat as other dendroatid frogs, such as Sophaga granulifera and Dendroates auratus, to advertise false toxicity. However, as you can see from these pictures, none of them resemble to each other. And also the fact that there is not batracotoxin uh, shouldn't mean that it's not chemically dependent because there are other alkaloids that could um, aid in deterring predators. And there's still some anecdotal evidence that this frog could be toxic for at least as a snake and for the human gene. So the big question is, is Philoatus vitatus toxic? So I assessed this. I wanted to test whether the skin of Philoatus vitatus caused toxicity or irritant effects on mice. I conducted a median lethal uh, dose test in mice, as I mentioned. This kind of test, uh, what it gives is the dose that costs 50% of, that kills 50% of a sampling uh, of a sampling population. So uh, I injected frog skin extract subcutaneously to mice, and I followed the guidelines from the OECD with percentages of a limit dose. So in, in summary, I tried to determine a, an LD20, LD50, and LD80, which are the treatments, just different doses with uh, increasing concentration, and as control, I use saline solution. So with this uh, dose that I use in the experiment, uh, there was no mortality in mice, but we did record the presence of toxicity symptoms. And this is the list of symptoms we observed in the mice. There are some symptoms that are common for all the different uh, treatments but other symptoms appeared only in the higher doses. In this figure, you can see the proportion of symptoms in the y-axis, and in the x-axis, you can see the time since injection according to the different treatments. So for the control, there were no toxicity symptoms, so all the uh, sampling points are in zero. But for the other doses, we found a general pattern that toxicity depends on the dose. Um, so higher doses caused more toxicity symptoms. And we also found that most of the symptoms appear during the first hour after injection, and then they all decrease. So actually at the end of the observation period, all mice were completely recovered. So this suggests that the effects that these alkaloids may have on predators is very immediate. Then uh, I wanted to test whether there, there were differences in toxicity among sampling localities, as this has been uh, shown to occur in other dendroatid poison frogs, but I didn't find it. So in this uh, figure, you can see that um, these are the different localities, and this is the control. So they are all different from the control that was saline solution, but there were no differences among the localities. So I wanted to know which were the alkaloids in their skin that could cause these toxicity symptoms we observed. So we analyzed um, alkaloids 
through liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. We did find batracotoxin. We found specifically a batracotoxin in A. This is an alkaloid that is categorized as having a high toxicity, and it could cause symptoms such as ataxia, difficulty breathing, salivation, and convulsions. We found a decahydrofinolin. This, is, this alkaloid is characterized as having low toxicity, but it could cause some symptoms as, such as locomotor difficulties and convulsions. And we found a lemizidine, which is not uh, toxic, but it's categorized as unpalatable, meaning that it, it, it might have like a very distasteful taste. So it could, it could also work as a chemical defense or deterrent of predators. These are just a few of the alkaloids we found, and the rest you can uh, see them in the paper if you are interested. Um, and just to give you uh, an idea of, of where in the populations or in the sampling localities we found these alkaloids, we found batracotoxin in, in just two of the localities and the lemicidine in the three localities. But this didn't, uh, this wasn't translated into differences in toxicity among localities. So to wrap up, uh, we provided the first experimental evidence that the complete array of skin alkaloids found in Philoatus vitatus does confer toxicity to mice. However, their toxicity is not as high as the species from Colombia. We established a list of symptoms for ranking non-lethal toxicity and cardiotonic effects of alkaloids in mouse models. And we provided the basis for future research on the chemical ecology of this Costa Rican endemic poison frog. So for instance, um, the dietary source of batracotoxin is still unknown. So since we found this alkaloid in some localities from Costa Rica, we are now studying the frogs stomach content in a collaboration with the University of Costa Rica in order to identify the dietary source of this alkaloid. And now I just want to briefly tell you a little bit about my current research in the Predators and Toxic Prey Research Group and in collaboration with the Center for Mind and Brain Sciences from the University of Trento. I am now studying predator psychology, so the neural correlates of multimodal signal perception in bird predators of aposematic prey. Just in other words, is what makes a warning signal effective? Does it cause a differential activation in the predator of, in the brain of predators? So in order to test this, I'm conducting behavioral experiments using chicks as model predators. And I'm, analyze, I'm analyzing uh, brain activation patterns through CFOS immunohistochemistry. I also want to integrate the behavioral and chemical ecology of antipredators of antipredator defenses using poison frog as aposematic prey models. So with that, I would like to thank the institutions that were in part of this that were part of this research, as well as my current research group and the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology for allowing me to present today. So thank you very much for joining today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Just one question. Mm -hmm. The birds preyed less on the clay frog creatures Mm -hmm. uh, but could it just be because the birds are maybe more intelligent? <laughs> okay, uh, they are asking if birds are, are preying less on the clay models because they are more intelligent. Uh, well, actually, uh, the results from my study are different from most of the other researchers that have used this kind of... Uh, approach and it's only in my study that birds are like the are not 
that important predator. So birds are actually, um, let's say, really smart, but I think that it's not the explanation on why they are not predating on these models. I think that in this case, since these frogs are very um, associated with streams, the uh, predator community is rather different than the other study sites. So this might be the reason why there is more predation by crabs or lizards. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>